We're in a state of emergency, Buhari says to new service chiefs. Also, the Senate has urged the president to give a timeline to new service chiefs to tackle the problems of insecurity. And INEC assures adequate security at Niger State by elections. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Ann O'Conn. President Muhammad Buhari has told the, the new service chiefs that the country is in a state of emergency, urging them to be patriotic and to serve well. The Senate also asked the president as a matter of urgency to give a timeline to the new service chiefs to tackle the problems of insurgency, kidnapping, armed banditry and other security challenges in the country. And to follow this conversation, joining us to have it, we have uh, two security experts, Peter Egbedian and Efe Wanago. It's good to have you gentlemen join us. Thank you for having me, Maria. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Dr. Steve. All right, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to start with you, Ife. How feasible is this timeline that the Senate is uh, setting uh, for security chiefs, bearing in mind that we're not necessarily fighting, uh, fighting a traditional war? Uh, we have insurgency on one side, we have banditry, we have kidnapping, we have cultism. I mean, the list is endless. Can we really say that if, uh, you know, a timeline is feasible? Well, I, I think it is of everything being considered because the nature of what we are fighting is not an unknown enemy. You can say it is not conventional warfare, but Boko Haram, um, uh, what do you call them, bandits, uh, health, criminal health men and what have you, they are not an unknown enemy. They are police operandi and very well in the public domain. And the theatre of warfare has been going on for a while. Different ultimates have been given at various times for the end of the world has not happened. So my take would be that here the timeline is achievable if everything that we put on the table is brought to bear. If we decide to pay only lip service and the requisite support is given to the new helmsmen of the different services, they can achieve a lot in, in 90 days. They can achieve a lot from the world uh, But my point is, it is not enough for us to just pay lip service and expect them to achieve results without changing the modus operandi, without changing what is available to them in terms of equipment, the arsenals of warfare, and of course, lifting the morale of the soldiers and the battle front. So we must do all these other things for us to have a feasible and definitive timeline. Otherwise, it will just be paying rich families again. Peter, the, the, the Buhari administration in 2015, just before they came into office, promised, you know, to kick out Boko Haram from Nigeria. They promised that we were going to have a safe heaven when they came into power. And I'm talking about the APC. Um, mm -hmm. They set that timeline. Five years down the line, we're still talking about insecurity. In fact, at a very heightened level. So really, should we be giving timelines at this moment or letting you know, these guys just do their job and hope that you know, the best will come out at the end of the day? Well, um, it's it's only fair to give them the benefit of the doubt, even though the antecedents of this administration do not point towards um, any reason for optimism. Um, however, we've seen the troops, we've seen, we've seen some videos online of um, purportedly of Nigerian troops rejoicing at the, at the dismissal or outstar of the, of the previous service chiefs. And that, 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 says, that tells that there is um, an upsurge of morale amongst, amongst our fighting forces which will be in itself good. Um, the Buhari administration has failed terribly when it comes to security. Um, three years running, I'll, I'll, see, I'll even say four years, Nigeria has been in the top five of most terrorized nations across the world. So um, on, on, at face value, it's, okay, it's fair to give them benefit of doubt, but considering their, their antecedents, considering their accomplishments or lack of it, then there's, there's no reason to be optimistic that this change in service chiefs will produce much, much results. Yeah, the Senate Committee uh, on the Army um, yesterday said that with the President providing the Army and service chiefs 
um, with all they need, all the needed tools uh, to deliver, they have, they have to come up with an active timeline. Now, what I want to emphasize on is all mm -hmm. they need to deliver. I'm coming back to you, Efe. And you mentioned it okay. when you, in your intro. Um, we've also had issues, you know, um, of welfare, um, boosting morale. We, we had issue of more bond equipment, but monies are still earmarked for these equipments to be updated. Can we really say that now that we have new service chiefs, monies that are supposed to get to the guys who are um, in the forefront of winning this war against um, insecurity, this monies will get to them. And also, um, everything that needs to um, be equipped with, uh, these guys need to be equipped with, can be given to them. Or are we going to have another story emanate halfway through this uh, administration? You know, we can only be hopeful, Mary Ann. Uh, if you recall, a few months ago, there was the report of um, some soldiers making their way with some hundreds of millions of naira from the general who reportedly had diverted it uh, from the war on terror. With such things happening, the chances are that most of the funds made available will be taken away by corrupt um, officers and generals within the military. So we expect that beyond changing service chiefs, the political will is required to hold the top echelon of the military, to hold their feet to the fire of accountability. It is not enough to release the humongous budget. Remember when the billion dollars was on the board of the National Assembly and everybody rallied around and they had to pass it? Several hundreds of millions of dollars have been approved, you know. But for that to be seen, to make a difference in the theater of warfare by the Nigerian soldier who is out there day and night, toiling and shedding blood and paying the ultimate price for Nigeria, it's another matter entirely. So I expect that apart from giving this authority to these people and providing the funds, the funds must be tracked. You must follow the money because, you know, security money has been seen over time, particularly in the public security sector. It has been seen over time as a black box. You can only approve, allocate, you don't ask questions. But who's so going to, who's time, going to trace the money, questions. FA? Who's going to trace the money? Yes. Because you've also mentioned that <laughs> security money is somewhat shrouded in some form of secrecy. Um, so who's going to do the tracking and tracing of the money to make sure that monies get to the people that these monies are meant for? Who's going to do that? I know we have the, for the police, we have the Police Service Commission. We have the minister in charge of... Um, these are um, soldiers and, you know, the forces. But really, whose job is it to make sure that these monies are tracked? If, if I were the president, I would hold the NSC accountable for that. Most of these agencies have internal checks, internal mechanisms to check themselves, but that would not be enough. That's why the NSC becomes the clearing house. So for me, for whatever approval that is made, whatever release that is made, I would put it on the feet of the NSC to ensure that every phone that is expended is tracked down to the minutest detail and be sure that we have value for money. Because that is one thing that the NSA has also been in office for a very long time. Beyond the service chief that have been changed, he has been there for ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he should step up his game and ensure that value is gotten by the ordinary Nigerians. Our soldiers cannot remain there in subhuman conditions and being killed because they don't have weaponry that is required to fight the war, to prosecute the war, and then we keep on saying, talking about timelines and saying lip service here and there. No, this must not happen. As, like I said to Jonathan and Maria, heads must begin to roll. There has to be some semblance of consequence management. People must be held to account for their office, their time in public service. So now, military and the warfare we have now, it's, where it's, it's, it's what's holding Nigeria in a delicate balance, in a matter of speaking. So those people who are out there, who have responsibility for administering these funds, must be held to account. And if we don't hold them to account, for me, it is criminal negligence on the part of the political class, of which Mr. President is number one. So he himself has to show that he's accountable, and he must demand the best from those persons he has appointed into office, and chief of which is the NSA. And then you cannot go to the service chief, the chief of defense staff, uh, who is at the head of the service chiefs. I think if that is done, we will begin to see results. It is not enough to say you guys must not be there and just waste time and what have you. You must have measurable uh, plans and uh, timelines, you know, terms of reference that you have given to them. Hmm. In month one, in the first 30 days, period, what have you done? What is on paper? What did you request? What did we provide for you? And the next 60 days, what are the milestones you told me they're going to achieve? 
Mm. Have you been able to free up X, Y, Z state and local governments from these people? Are they still operating anywhere? Our border system, where is the synchronity in terms of military, immigration, and other security agencies? You know, where is the handshake? How are we able to ensure that people do not continue to enter Nigeria and go out? Mm. If they continue to come in and go out and perpetrate criminality, whose job is it to have prevented that? Did you punish the person? So there are many things that have been going on for long. We keep on saying that uh, terrorism is global phenomenon and what have you. For me, it's an excuse for failure. This is okay. part of the problem we've had. When you hold people to account, you will find that they will deliver results. But okay. some are giving excuses have been issued. Okay, let me come to you, Peter. Also in the statement by um, uh, the member of that committee in the Senate um, on the Army, uh, he did talk about the politics of reporting and the hierarchy in the army. He did say that um, the army should be sure not to report to the chief of staff to the president. Um, he also said that this, he advised against it and said that it is illegal and it will one way or the other um, not allow for effective service delivery. And for people who have worked in security, I want to ask you, Peter, what do you think he meant by that? And what should be the modus operandi when it comes to reporting and the hierarchy in the army? Why does the chief of staff, who's a civilian, um, have to come into play in the first instance? Um, I, and I think the sentence, the sentence is overreaching. Um, the, the doctrine, the, the modus operandi of, of, the, of, of our fighting forces, of our security forces, um, they are, they are, they, each, each person is accountable to his, to his direct leader. Um, and in that case, within the, the top brass of the military, their, their loyalties will lie to in those things. I mean, there are seven Nigeria, but it, 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 the way these things are done is that they report directly to their, chef, to their, to their leaders, to their commanders, and, 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 and likewise. It would be this, and these are the things that make us worried about whether this government is serious about effecting change. You talked about briefly about a few minutes ago about how they're giving timelines and they said they will now give everything that they need to give for this thing for the for the war to be to be to be, to be fought successfully. My question is why was it not done before? The, 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 I remember in June last year, um, a, a major general was court martialed for leaking a viral video explaining that the Nigerian military was being overrun at the forefront by Boko Haram, their superior um, equipment. Looking at this issue now, my, my worry is that statements like the Senate is making will only politicize the process more, will make things more difficult, um, especially for the new, the new service chiefs now. But, do you think that, do you, but don't you think that if there wasn't a need for them to make that statement, they wouldn't have made it in the first place? Because he, he sounded more concerned about the fact that the army should not be reporting to the chief of staff. They should not do that because it's not good for effective service delivery. Obviously, they feel that it's not supposed to be part of the plan in the first instance. Don't you think so? Well, Peter, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I thought I thought on my. I was going to take a question. No, so no, no, I was asking. I, I agree you. that it, it, it's born out of um, concern. Um, but you have to find the most effective way of getting this thing done. Even the most effective way of getting things done revolves around going to the chief of staff. Then, by all means, um, by, by every means necessary that is legal, we must prosecute this, this, this issue and get it sorted out once and for all. Um, many, any bottleneck that we put in place administratively or politically is unwelcome. In fact, that's an enemy of, of the progress of, of Nigeria. So, if that is what will work, I mean, we're tired of this false trading and blame and buck trading. If, if that is going to work, if that is what will work, then by every means, let's get it done. Interesting. Ife, would you like to comment on that? Because I'm making emphasis on this because the army would tell you that they follow orders, they follow command, there's no politicking when it comes to the army. But if people who are making our laws feel that they, they should mention the fact that no army official, not even the chief of army staff, should report to the chief of staff, to the president. Do you not think that maybe they feel like this politicking might be part of the problems that we have in rendering proper service uh, in terms of security? 
Efe, can you hear me? Yes, oh, Miriam, uh, confirm you can hear me. Yes, that, was, that question was for you. Okay, so I was saying that I think you must check the ego of people that we expose to public office. There are standards worldwide. Uh, if the president decides that for him declaring out the chief of staff, mm -hmm. so do it. For me, I would rather say the NSA. But my, my worry is that we should not prosecute this war like an everyday bureaucratic governmental process. There has to be some urgency to it. So we do not, we have to remove the red tape. We have to remove that tunnel of bureaucracy where you pass through one desk to the other desk from the NSA to the chief of staff and even maybe to the SSG before you get the commander in chief. People and the theater of warfare must have direct access to the service commander who must have access to Mr. President. But of course, there must be a team. If you recall, when the larger was to be taken out, we saw Barack Obama then, the president of the USA, as he then was, together with his security team, real-time control room, monitoring the situation, and giving orders. Mm -hmm. So how awful is our president getting feedback from the theater of war? So beyond the nomenclature, for me, I, I don't want to talk about a civilian uh, being the person receiving reports from military. No, a civilian has been the head of the CIA and the NSA in the U.S., and they have done pretty well, right? So that we have generals at NSA and what have you does not superimpose, or does not imply that they have their exclusive preserve. The point is whoever is responsible to superintend and oversee them must have the ears of the president. And you cannot run them, you cannot run this military, this warfare we have, as a normal, routine, bureaucratic process. You would fail. Okay. They have to get urgency to it. It must not be a case of every week we have a meeting with the president. There are times where you need to convene an emergency council of your war team, your war room. And it will be at 2 a.m. in the night, it will be a very short notice. You do what you have to do and you get Mr. President if you need his attention. And he is there to give his blessing. So the whole idea about a civilian chief of staff for me doesn't arise. It makes sense for us, of course, to have a proper channel because military and security is usually a regimented um, profession. Yeah. You understand? But as it is now, I expect the president to break down his urgency, down the nose of everybody that has put in office. With that urgency, it will be immaterial who is there in the chain of command. Your job is to deliver and report back. You deliver. When you have a recuperancy, you report back on your recuperancy. When you think that you are not being given where we thought to work, then you seek to have audience with the superior at the highest level. And if you think that you are being uh, stampeded and eroded, you have to live politely. You would have been true to yourself. Okay. So I don't believe that people who hold office should continue to give excuses and say, because this happened, I did not work effectively. When you did not work effectively, what did you do? When the person was there, what did you do? So okay. for me, the box stops on the table of Mr. President. He must demand 100% accountability from his appointees, and he must be able to full strength to ensure that everything that they require, they get at least 95%, if not 100%. Let's, let's move on to other things. Now, the Sun newspaper here in Nigeria reported uh, recently that there's been a, a development in the army that um, 45 senior military officials um, submitted their retirement letters, and these people uh, consist of major generals, brigadier generals, and some people from the NDA. Apparently, um, they, they're also in the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, and the anger is that junior ranking officers were made service chiefs, and these are people who are somewhat below them in ranks, or maybe were their classmates, and they probably allegedly feel slighted, and so 45 of these people have decided to, you know, step aside. But of course, this will be um, dependent on if they accept their retirement or not. But this is some also um, politics at play within the, the, the military, isn't it? Uh, this is for you, Peter. Well, I think, I think it's, it's, it's really going to demoralize our, 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 our military more. Typically, it's the most senior ranking officer that should be appointed. Um, but again, we're not, we, we, don't have, we, don't, we don't have the information with which uh, the screenings were done, that the president decided to pick who he has picked. Um, but that, that, that notwithstanding, this is only going to worsen the perception within the military that um, loyalty does not pay at the end of the day, because you have people who, who have come to the ranks and they've seen 
people who they believe have served a long time and who should be awarded with the um, the top brass um, positions are being the, um, disregarded and practically being pushed into retirement. So it's not going to be good for the for the morale of the, of the armed forces at all. And I think that again, um, this is why many people are, are skeptical about Mr. President's juggling of the service chiefs at this time. Um, if a, if a, a retired service uh, chief was quoted to say that the issue of retirement in the army um, is a tradition in the military, uh, he said that most times officers pay compliments to their seniors um, or the people they surpass um, in rank. Was this something to placate the issue because, you know, it's already out there and it's been reported by uh, a newspaper, a known newspaper. It's not, although the army is saying that uh, they, they're not commenting on this issue because it's supposed to be something done on the wraps. Yeah, uh, Mary Ann, you know, military hierarchy, what we have been exposed to in terms of practice, as far as the Nigerian environment is concerned, over time, whenever you appoint a service chief and he has anybody who is senior to him, the tradition is that the senior person who has been bypassed and his junior has been appointed will give way. Now, this may appear not to be ideal for many people, but I think that is how it works. If you want to breathe new life into a fight, the tendency is that the person who is outgoing, for instance, you can see that they've already got and welcome. They have done beyond 35 years in service. So you need somebody from a different course who is a younger person who has some more years before retirement to come in. And naturally, if you appoint somebody from course 34 or course 35 to come into office, those persons who are course 33, and 34 who are still left, it makes sense for them to give way because this is a highly regimented organization. If I was still in service, for instance, I would not work with my junior appointed, you know, to superintend over me. It doesn't work like that because even the day seniority, even in, in the role call, in the nominal role, somebody who is your senior by placement of position, even by name alone, demands some due and respect from you. So in this instance, I don't think it's an issue really. When appointments have been made, and uh, there's a saying in the military and security agency generally that appointment is better than rank. Once somebody gets an appointment, what do you do? You defer to him. If you cast your mind back, remember when Jeremiah, General Hussein was in the military, at the time he was the most senior person. But we had people like Abdul Salami, you know, heading the government, and we had other people becoming the chief of army staff, and Hussein was a minister. Because, of course, he was able to subdue himself. But some other people who feel very strongly about it will bow out and leave and say, there's no use of my being any longer. I've given my best. So I don't think this is an issue, really. Uh, the person that was appointed is a general. And they believe that once you are a general, you are both the greater general, down to major general, lieutenant general, you are able to deliver. So I, I think this is better the issue. We need to provide the requisite support to our men who are in the front lines. Now, if we have Atahiru, who is not the chief of army staff, and we have chief of defense staff, who is the senior, I understand, although they are all major generals, it's not a problem. Anybody who falls, you know, as a senior to these people, it should give way and allow them to function. Let's have new blood. Breaking new blood is not just in name. You need people who have fresh ideas, who may have been bottled up because they, they are not able to show what they have. Because if you are not called upon to show your potentials, there is no room for you to display your potentials. So I don't think it's a problem. Most of them have served 30 years, 28 years in service. It's not even more than you must do the whole 35 years or 60 years as the case may be. And if a president really exercises his discretion, he has done that. All we require, let's rally around those persons who have not been positioned to head different services and give them all the support that is needed so that they can, they can close out this war once and for all. And finally, guys, before, before we say our goodbyes, um, can, this, can Nigerians say for maybe the last time that the army, this administration would help them heave a sigh of relief in terms of getting respite uh, from all of the kidnappings and the killings on our highways and the cattle rustlings, the herders and farmers. Can we say that this is the one more time that Nigerians is giving them one more, um, another opportunity for the army and this administration to prove themselves that they can actually protect us our lives and our property. In closing. Okay, who's, who's, who's this Peter, for? Peter, you yeah. start first and then yeah, of course yeah. if we will wrap up. Okay, so I think it's, it's, um, it's a waste of um, 
emotions to think that this is going to be the the paradigm shift, the the turnaround for the, the, the challenges we are facing. I'll give an I'll give one basic reason why um, our 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 police is is overworked. Our our armed forces are overlabored. There's battle fatigue everywhere, and we are under police. We still need a lot of people to join the armed forces, to join the police, join the paramilitary. We still need to train these people on 21st century methods of doing, of, of policing, of securing the community or society. And that is not going to happen in three months or six months. So many of the challenges that currently exist will only persist. Okay. And if a, finally. Yeah, I think I want to show the line of uh, my colleague on the other side. Because the truth is that uh, you need to see some kind of urgency to this. This administration has been in power for upwards of six years now. And um, for me, I have not seen the requisite urgency. Remember that the campaign is to get into office on the tripod of security, economy, and corruption. For me, I think, as far as security is concerned, there has been no urgency whatsoever. I expected to see in the first few months of this government some kind of martial plan as far as security is concerned. I expected to see that the police would have been overhauled, that there would have been a plan to reposition our military, we should not be local champions in the West African sub-region. In fact, there is no evidence any longer that we are still strong in West Africa. Mm. So that has not really happened. And until we begin to see an urgency on the part of the political class, led by the commander-in-chief, which can now be cascaded down the entire line of service and its appointees, we will begin to see results. Like they say, it's from the initial steps that somebody makes in the dancing floor, you will know how it's going to perform later on. We have not seen that. I believe that when we begin to see Mr. President being very serious about what's on the ground, it will break down the heads and the noses of those people he has appointed. And then we begin to see things in place. For instance, why do we still have a centralized policy system as we have today? How are we going to solve kidnapping and uh, criminality in our country? We cannot. We must be centralized policing. Even if we retain an elite police force that will be an interventionist agency for certain category of crimes, you cannot centralize policing that we have done and expect to make success. You must be willing to devolve power. You run a federation the way the federation should be run, and you'll be able to reap the benefits you know, of that system. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ife Wanago and Peter Median. They are both the security experts. Thank you for having this conversation with me. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Mariana. It's a pleasure. Have a good night, then. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, INEC pledges adequate security at the Niger State by elections. We'll be talking with uh, an official of INEC when we come back. Stay with us.